Imagine building an entire application just by describing the vibe you want. No coding required. Just you talking to AI. Andre Karapati calls it vibe coding and it's making developers 10 times faster while letting complete beginners create software. Is this the democratization of programming we've been waiting for or a technical debt bomb waiting to explode? Well, let's find out. You guessed it. Today, we're talking about vibe coding. If you've ever felt intimidated by programming or wished that you could just tell a computer what you want and have it build it for you, well, that future is already here. Vibe coding is a term coined by Andre Karapati, former AI leader at Tesla and OpenAI, co-founder in February 2025. It described a revolutionary approach in programming where developers, in his words, fully give in to the vibe, embrace exponentials, and forget that the code even exists. Now, before we talk about implications and what we need to be careful about vibe coding, let's just see a quick demo where I used VS Code with GitHub Copilot agent mode to create a website to learn Azure using some flashcards. Here we go. All right, here we are in my VS Code agent mode. And what we are seeing here is my prompt that is telling agent mode to create a flashcard website in Python that is uh, listing Azure products from um, the attached CSV. I gave it a CSV. I also gave it an image of the flashcard website to um, try and mimic what I mean by the flashcards. And um, it is really mind blowing, right? It's telling me here are the f first few things I need to do. First, I need to set up a basic project structure. Then I need to create a Flask application, which reads the CSV file and then create HTML CSS for the flashcard display and then add interactivity with the hover effects. This is amazing. Now, what it's trying to do is reading my uh, my folder structure. I've created Azure flashcard folder and I see that the new empty project directory is already there and help you set up the Flask website. Great. So it knows what it is doing. It goes into the folder structure in my folder and then it um, uh, creates my um, environment, installs pandas and then that's what's happening on the left here. And then um, I would, because for some time it didn't quite too much it kept spinning and again these things are still new right so um, um, so I gave it another prompt I said I have created the file structure what's next and um, the next thing it does so I my mind was blown away with all this right because it is taking that CSV that I that that really I've given it in the past in my previous prompt and it says okay I noticed that you haven't really created any files in that structure yet so let me help you do that the first thing I'm going to do is create app.py file which is that flask application then requirements.txt and it starts to crank out the static folder and all of those things one by one and, and see on the left, it is creating that file and then asking me, do I want to keep it? So there's still that human in the loop element where I decide as the user, do I want to keep this file? Do I want to undo those changes? And I can decide to do that. And it goes into and now continues to do that. Like uh, it goes into the file structure directory and then creates the template for static and CSS files. I can click on done. And, um, and I will call it done. It's now creating index.html and in that index.html, which I'll show you uh, when I click on it, um, it, it, whenever it tries to navigate into the files, it asks me and I say continue and done, which is also again, that element of like, I am constantly involved in making these decisions. Um, the next thing that it's doing right now is um, installing uh, the requirements.txt. And again, I, I now click on the index.html and I'm able to see what it created, the style, the body, the containers and all that. Um, I'm going back into my uh, console, the terminal, and able to see that it is 
getting the requirements to build wheel. And I click on done because I couldn't wait any longer. It was taking way too long to do stuff. So I thought it's, it's you know, it's like stuck or something. So um, I quit that and I already have the file structure. So I look at all the files and now I'm going to actually just ask it to do, uh, to run the application. So here we go. run this application now because I know I have all the files at this point. Um, so GitHub Copilot goes in and looks for, okay, I'll help you run this Flask app. First, I should check if all the requirements and dependencies are installed. Um, and it sees that um, it's, it goes in and looks at my requirements.txt file, tries to install all the requirements, which is great. That's exactly how I would run it. All right, and there we go. We have some error. And honestly, I'm not even trying to read the error here, right? I'm trying to really have agent mode um, do the fixing as well. So um, my hands are off. I see that there are some issues installing pandas. I'm going to try to redo that. This is amazing. Um, and then it tries to go in and reinstall some of the dependencies. I'll try installing the requirements using pip in a different way since there are issues with pandas installation. That's what it decides to do, which is great. Um, and then it does flask installation and pandas installation again. Great. I see both flask and pandas successfully installed. Let's run the flask application. And it now tries to run the um, run our app with Python app.py. And there we go. It sees that there is another compatibility issue between Flask and so it tries to fix for that compatibility issue as well. Um, and let's see what it does after it installed that uh, the new version and now Python app.py is going to try and run, run the app again. And we see on the left, we have the app running on 127.0.0.1 at, at port 5000. And when I navigate to that, I'm able to see my flashcard app. Really? I was blown away with this because I literally just gave it an image and I said, this is what I want built. I want to do it in Python with Flask and uh, a CSV file with these details and that CSV I created with, uh, with also with ChatGPT, honestly. And, and all of that went in into the prompt and it generated the entire code for this and deployed it um, on the local host. I am blown away. It fixed an error along the way, it fixed dependencies along the way. Amazing. Now, this isn't just using AI to help with coding. As Simon Willison perfectly puts it, if an LLM wrote every line of your code, but you've reviewed, tested, and understood it all, that's not vibe coding. That's using an LLM as a typing assistant. Instead, vibe coding really represents a fundamental shift in software development. You provide the high-level descriptions or vibes in natural language or voice instead of writing code line by line, just like how I did it in the demo. Your role really shifts from typing out code to guiding, testing, and refining what AI creates. The benefits of this approach are pretty mind-blowing. First, let's talk about speed and productivity. Some projects are seeing up to 10% faster completion times. All that repetitive boilerplate code automated away. You can rapidly prototype and iterate on ideas in a fraction of the time. The barrier to entry for creating software just dropped dramatically. Entrepreneurs, designers, and domain experts can now build functional applications without coding expertise. And finally, there's the focus on creativity. Your focus shifts 
from syntax and implementation details to high-level creativity and product design. You can quickly experiment with new ideas without significant time investment. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There are legitimate concerns about wide coding. When it comes to code quality and reliability, AI-generated code may contain bugs or even security vulnerabilities that non-experts cannot really identify. Users become dependent on AI to fix issues in code that they really don't understand. Complex applications may require more structure than wide coding can provide. So wide coding isn't right for every situation. It excels in some very specific scenarios for rapid prototyping and MVPs. It's perfect for quickly testing ideas and building minimum viable products. It's ideal for hackathons and startups and other fast paced environments and really great for those throwaway weekend projects. While everyone can use wide coding, some groups will gain the most. Non-technical creators, like those entrepreneurs with software ideas but limited technical skills, can now bring their visions to life, which is huge. Content creators looking to build tools for their audiences benefit tremendously. Domain experts who need custom solutions for specific problems can now build them themselves. Time-constrained developers that are working on rapid prototypes save precious hours. Small teams with limited resources can also now build quickly without hiring more engineers. As AI models continue to improve, wide coding will likely become more capable and reliable. While it won't replace traditional software development entirely, I think, it represents that significant shift in how we approach coding and who can participate in software creation. It may enable solutions to problems that might otherwise go unaddressed due to technical barriers. Now, wide coding isn't just a trend, it's part of a fundamental transformation in how humans interact with computers and create digital solutions. So, what do you think? Is wide coding the future of programming? Will it democratize software creation or create a new generation of developers who don't understand the fundamentals of what they are building? Well, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If you've tried wide coding, I would love to hear what you've built. What was your experience like? Put that in the comments as well. And if you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe for more content on cloud and AI, and hit that notification bell to be the first one to know when I post a new video. Until next time, happy coding, or should I say happy vibing? <laughs> Bye.